Greetings, everyone, and happy Wednesday. It's good to see you all here, and good to have you here on the internet. We're very excited that uh, this is the first time we're offering this Teaching Now broadcast over the internet, so we have uh, people from all over enjoying this opportunity. So on behalf of the Way of Compassion Foundation, just want to welcome all of you on the internet as well as everyone here in the room. And uh, we're really looking forward to this opportunity. We've had this come about as a result of requests from people that um, just haven't had the opportunity to get the Dharma teachings. There's a couple people that had waited three months just to get to one Dharma talk. And so we thought, we have the technology. We do this every week. So let's make it happen. So uh, it's really quite exciting. So I have to get used to speaking to the camera and you. So I'm going to try to just ignore the camera and be here with uh, the group in Carbondale. And for all of you out there, just know that we do do this teaching every week in Carbondale. And we have a nice little sangha here. Um, our primary teachings have been the seven-point mind training. And so every Wednesday we go through the seven-point mind training. We're using a text by Alan Wallace. And uh, we're at the seventh point already. On the last Wednesday of every month, we have um, this text by His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, and this is on the eight verses of Thought Transformation. So the last Wednesday of every month, we've touched base on this because we have uh, little sanghas that are located in different parts of the country, from Gunnison and Telluride to Oklahoma and Naples, Florida, and uh, a few other places in between that come together as a sangha, and so we've been going through these eight verses every month. Tonight, we're on the seventh verse, uh, which is a very rich teaching, and is actually an all-inclusive practice of Tong Lin. So what I thought we would do tonight uh, is cut our initial meditation a little shorter. Normally, we do it for 24 minutes. Uh, yeah, I know, 25 is just crazy. 24 minutes. Uh, and tonight, just cut down to 15 because uh, after a bit of teaching, we'll do the Tong Lin meditation as part of the teaching tonight, uh, which is a practice of taking and giving, this uh, practice of cultivating bodhicitta. So um, let's just invite everyone to get comfortable and relaxed. Have a position that uh, if you'd like to talk about a posture of vigilance, which means I'm here to meditate. Uh, key aspects, though, is relaxation. So we want to be relaxed. So adopting a posture in which our back is straight, tongue touching the roof of the mouth, and a relaxed body. So we'll begin with a little body scan. We'll relax and release tension that we've had throughout the day. And if you do nothing more than relax without falling asleep, you're doing a good job. And then from there, we just work a little better on focus on bringing our awareness back to our breath. The mantra for when you uh, find your mind wandering, the mantra is no problem. No problem. So your mind wanders, no problem. The mind's a busy place. It tends to wander. We want to just let go of that. No worries. Relax. Release the thoughts. Return your awareness to the breath. Mind wanders a thousand times, we bring it back a thousand and one. And in that way, we have a thousand and one mindful moments. So it's not uh, in any way failure, it's actually success. We just had a thousand and one mindful moments that we wouldn't have had otherwise. So the idea here is to relax, release tension, don't fall asleep, and as much as possible, be aware of the breath as it enters and exits your body. You're going to let the breath be natural. We don't modify it. We don't breathe deeply. Don't worry about shallow breath. We just let the breath be. So we'll begin in just a moment. Right now, I invite everyone to just become present in your body. Just take a moment to relax. And before we begin, take a moment to set your motivation, your intention 
for participating in this teaching tonight. Of all the things we could be doing on a Wednesday night, we've come here to cultivate merit and wisdom, to cultivate bodhicitta, to access our highest potentials of this precious human life. From our side in the Tibetan tradition, we always set a bodhicitta aspiration so that this can truly be a benefit to all beings. That whatever benefit we get here, whatever benefit we receive from participating, it helps us cultivate merit and wisdom that we can use on our path and truly benefit all living beings. But I invite you to take a moment to set your motivation, your intention, your purpose for being here. I am. It's Wednesday. So, as mentioned uh, previously, on the last Wednesday of every month, we are uh, going through the eight verses of thought transformation. This is a very precious practice. It's one His Holiness says he does every morning. In one of the first sadhanas I was ever taught, it's embodied in that whole sadhana, the practice of Chen Rei Sig. And I have found it to be, in my own personal life, just a well-rounded path that really cultivates a way of being in the world. Um, much more about how to be in the world rather than just how to sit and do practice. You know, we've talked here all the time about that difference of dharma, right? Dharma has a lot more to do with how we treat our neighbors than how long I sit in meditation. It can be how long you sit in meditation, but uh, I can sit there a long time. If I'm not really working on changing my mind, on cultivating a path that's going to really deal with the obscurations of my mind, it's not going to be that beneficial. So the core of these teachings are how do we bring this into our daily life? How do we make all of our life practice? How do we make Dharma a part of everything that we do? And one of the really wonderful definitions of Dharma that I've heard from Alan Wallace. When you talk about what is Dharma, how do we know if we're doing Dharma? How do we know if we're practicing Dharma? And he has this uh, measurement. He says, well, Dharma is anything that you're doing that's going to cultivate a genuine happiness an inner peace and a well-being. And by genuine happiness, he's talking about the ultimate happiness, a liberation of suffering. So anything that we're doing that's cultivating a genuine happiness, and this well-being, this genuine happiness, usually comes along uh, three basic categories. We call them three higher trainings. Ethics, concentration, and wisdom. This is the training of the path to really cultivate our highest potentials, to eliminate suffering in our lives, and to find some genuine happiness and liberation. Within this ethics, concentration, and wisdom, uh, we find uh, the ground of it being ethics. All spiritual growth, all spiritual growth is based on a foundation of ethics. So without that piece, I can go and sit in a corner and meditate and stare at a wall a long time. But not much will grow. I can cultivate concentration. I can cultivate concentration. But without the nourishment of ethics, uh, it's not going to transform much other than the ability to really concentrate. It's this fusion that ethics and how I live my life and what I'm coming into the world with is the nourishment from which when I go to meditate and concentrate, they feel each other. How I treat my neighbor is my dharma practice. You know, uh, what's the mind I'm bringing to my meditation? Why am I meditating? Has a big part of whether I'm practicing dharma or not. But the ground of it, really understanding that if it's grounded in ethics, ethics is going to cultivate the merit. So 
if I want to practice Dharma, I want to cultivate two things. Two things. I often call it virtue and wisdom. Uh, sometimes merit and wisdom. I like virtue. But we can talk about fields of merit. And essentially, you can think of it as, uh, as good karma, virtuous activity. And as I do this, I'm going to find that I'm creating the conditions from which I can grow, where I can really cultivate my highest potentials. If we think of our potentials as seeds in this field of consciousness, this ground that we're cultivating, we want to nourish it with ethics. When I'm ethical, I'm not really going to be that worried or concerned or stressed as I go to meditate. I'll have a calm mind. When I'm agitated, when I'm upset, when I have conflict within myself, it's much harder to meditate. It's much harder to bring that calm mind. Plus, with this virtue, I'm cultivating other conditions. I'm purifying my mind in the sense of creating a calmness. But I'm also creating the conditions from which we can have spiritual teaching, where we can have right conditions. So all the time that I'm participating in my ethics, I'm creating the conditions and the environment from which I can really practice Dharma. So cultivating this virtue in all things is really important. Then I can bring this mind, this unwieldy mind, try to lasso that thing for a moment <laughs> to get it to go where I'd like. If I'm practicing ethics, if I'm cultivating a way of being in the world that's virtuous, then I have much more to work with when I sit down. Otherwise, it's kind of like pouring water on a rock, you know, not, not going to work too well. They talk about, uh, and we've talked about it here, the, to be a, a proper vessel, to be a student of Dharma. As remember the three problems with the pot? Okay, so if we're a dharma, we're a pot, and we're going to pour dharma into the pot. So if we want to practice dharma for a dharma teaching, we need to be a proper vessel. So one of the problems, which we're talking about right now, is a dirty pot. If my ethics aren't very pure, if I uh, go out into the world and um, really create a lot of problems uh, around attachment and greed and what I want and uh, get angry and resentful and so forth, and uh, live an unethical life, my pot's dirty. So no matter how pure the Dharma is, as it goes into the pot, it ruins this precious nectar. So one is the, the dirty pot. The other one is the covered pot. <laughs> right? And, uh, and this is a, a very fascinating uh, issue because I find that... Um, it's one of the bigger problems that we don't really pay attention to is uh, the idea that we have a closed mind so that when the Dharma comes, I'm a closed pot. It's not going to go in because I have answers. See, I know what's going on. And uh, if we want to find any obstacle greater than the presumption of knowledge as a block of learning, I don't know what it is. Because we do this in our daily life, right? When we're talking with someone, when we're being with people, if I have the answer, you know, I'm not going to learn from you because I'm just waiting for you to be quiet so I can set you straight. The biggest barrier to learning anything is the presumption of knowledge that I know. And uh, Dalai Lama, likes, there's a quote, um, I won't get it precise, but it's something to the extent if um, you can't learn if you're the only one talking. Because you're only saying things you already know. How can you possibly learn? And in this sense of a covered pot is to have an open mind, but a critical mind. This does not mean that we take anything. I mean, it's real clear. You take nothing here on blind faith. You test it. If it holds up, then we keep it. If it doesn't, we cast it aside. But we have to be open to new knowledge, open to new opportunities, to have a mind that's curious. And this is really powerful in how we really address people in the world that we come in contact with, not just Dharma. You know, if we have a curious mind. As a matter of fact, this is one of the uh, real powerful tools of cultivating empathy. When we talk about empathy, is whoever we're talking to, to cultivate an interest, a curiosity about them. 
and openness. And this way we can learn because everyone you meet, everyone you meet, knows more than you do about something. Everyone you meet is better at many things than you are. And we can all learn from each other. And the barrier there is this presumption of knowledge. So we don't want to be a covered by. So we want to come with an open mind, we want to come ethically, we want to be a good pot that's clean. We're going to take the lid off of the Dharma, and then we're going to try to avoid the biggest catastrophe, the leaky pot. <laughs> right? Pours in, that was a great Dharma teaching. Wow, that was really amazing. Uh, what was that he said again? Uh, that, you know, what was that? Dharma? And uh, I'm very guilty of this myself. I, uh, I have copious notes, copious notes, vast notes of teachings on this, actually, and of the seven-point mind training that I've received from my teacher, Venerable Geshe Sultan Gelson, you know, a year and a half. I've got like five years of notes. I've got videos of him for five years of teaching. Now, have I read the notes? That's a whole different question. You know, I, we'd go to the teachings, we'd write these notes. And this is the, this is the, the Dharma. This is going to liberate you. This is the, the precious nectar. And then close the notebook. And then next week, go there. And, and then the teaching. And then I'm open. And then I'm reviewing. And then Geshe is sitting up there, you know, like throwing out questions to us. And we're all going, uh, yeah. Uh, he was so patient with us. So he'd spend half a teaching, you know. Often just recap. But this idea of not being a leaky pot, that what we learn here is having an imprint. It's something that we can refresh, something that we can bring to mind. And uh, let these uh, little seeds of knowledge grow. So the three problems of the pot. Dirty pot, covered pot, leaky pot. So when it comes to teachings, try to be a good vessel so we can receive this path of liberation. And if we're well prepared then, um, we can practice Dharma. You know, Dharma again is what is it that is removing suffering? Ultimately, that's what the Buddha taught, how to remove suffering. So if I'm practicing Dharma, I'm doing things to remove afflictions and suffering in my life, and I'm cultivating virtue and wisdom. Wisdom liberates us from all the suffering, because that's our, our big problem, is we don't see things clearly. We live in a fantasy land. It's a very fascinating place that has no bearing with reality. You know, that little fantasy land where people don't get sick and cars don't break down. And I get the dream job. And I get the proper amount of vacation. And I'll be happy when. You know, which bears no reality, right, to the world that we live in, right? People get sick, cars break down. I have to say that over and over again. Because we can say it all day long, and then we still get stunned when we get the news that, ah, I just got laid off. Oh, I've got cancer. And, and then it becomes this unique, I have cancer. I am cancer. As opposed to, I'm one amongst millions of people <laughs> who are living with cancer, which is a part of this human existence that we live in, that we call some samsaric conditioned existence. And just like me, a million other people are. And, uh, and that that's a part of this process of life. So learn to live in the real world, where we have hospitals, because we have cancer centers, we have um, this compelling delusion that if things just line up and go my way, I'll be happy. If I get this jacket for the winter, this ski pass, mm -hmm. we live in Carbondale, ski pass, the season's gone. Now, if that's not the cause for genuine happiness, what is, right? Um, or if just these things fall into place. And really the entry, and this is back to this wisdom, the entry to a Buddhist path, the entry of Buddhist path, is, ren is renunciation. So if we're going to become Buddhist, if we even think about being a Buddhist, ultimately that means I'm a renunciant. So does that mean we all get robes and uh, 
drink hot water and uh, have our rice, stop eating after midday. Now that's not really a renunciate. You could have all those things and be very attached to worldly things. Um, a renunciate really is this sense of uh, renouncing the delusion. Renouncing the delusion that anything outside of you is going to make you happy, ultimately. Because all of this samsara, all of this conditioned existence is ultimately unsatisfying. It has the roots of all of our suffering. Everything. Everything that comes together falls apart. Every relationship we will have will come and go. All of us are aging. We're all one day closer to our death. The things that give us great joy, when we reflect upon them, wind up being the things that we worry about the most, that we agonize over. The things that we think will cause us the greatest amount of happiness and joy in life become the causes from which I have all my suffering. The things that I think will make me happy are the things I worry about. And they provide this temporary stimulus-driven pleasure, and I keep attaching to that. And, uh, and then I build a world where if I just line it up so I'm going to live to be 90 and healthy and, you know, have the right kind of world out there, and my life will be good. And so we want to give up the delusion that anything outside of you is going to create any lasting happiness and understand that things outside of us provide us temporary pleasure. That's fine. Like right now, temporary pleasure, hot water. Train my grandkids with that. Ah, where are they getting from? But when we understand that, we can start to see the world as it is. We're cultivating wisdom. We're cultivating wisdom and understanding that the world I get to live in, whether I derive pleasure from hot water or not, has much more to do with how I live my life than whether the water's hot. That ultimately all pleasure and suffering is coming from how I live my life. That the experience that I have uh, when I interact and how I see people is coming from the conditions I've created in my life. So a renunciate understands that and stops trying to create the world around them to make them happy and understanding that if I want genuine happiness and well-being, I change how I live my life. That I'm planting the seeds of karmic imprints that are going to ripen into pleasurable or unpleasurable experiences by how I live my life. And this is that field, then, of virtue. And this virtue combined with wisdom, I can start making healthier choices. Right? If somebody's yelling at me, I could, you know, set them straight. I could, oh, no, you didn't. And we're going to have a talk, and I could get in their face. And, you know, we're going to talk about this. And you don't talk to me like that and don't disrespect me. And I can come back in anger. But what have I just done in the way the world really works? I saw someone suffering. Because that's why they yell. Nobody's yelling because they're happy. They're yelling because they're upset. And I reacted with anger and intolerance. I hurt them. And then I get to feel pretty good about it because then I'm going to go. Tell my buddies, yeah, you know who tried to talk to me about so-and-so? And I set them straight. Well, I just created the perfect, complete karma of anger with intention, with action, and with outcome. Of planting seeds of having more people yell at me <laughs> and more anger in my life. Wisdom is to understand when someone's yelling at me, they're suffering. Suffering and out of compassion, I can respond. I can say, I can see you're upset. I'm really sorry about that. What can I do to help? Wow, if that didn't shift the conversation, doesn't work every time, trust me. <laughs> but it certainly has worked most of the time to shift the energy of the situation. But ultimately, regardless of what happens now, the action is coming out of compassion as a motive. To remove suffering and then the action of asking how can I help and then the outcome perfect karma of cultivating compassion and that plants what kind of seeds you have less people yell at you <laughs> you 
it's an interesting world that we live in this way. And even when they do, we're not as affected by it. Because when people do yell, I understand they're suffering. And it's not <clears> personal. <throat> they're just giving what they have. So as we live this way, and this is starting to live in a real world, the way it actually operates, as opposed to the way I label and perceive, that's a jerk, that's someone I like, that's, you know, the perfect day. This is the best day ever. Yeah, I love the way we exaggerate. Best day ever. And uh, until the next best day. Or the worst day ever. When in fact, it's probably just Wednesday. And uh, the days aren't good or bad. Just Wednesday. So this is all a lead into practicing Dharma. So if I want to practice Dharma, it helps to have some wisdom to understand how the world works. Otherwise, I'm going to start thinking that there's jerks and idiots and annoying people in the world. And as we've all done this uh, class many times, there are no idiots or jerks or annoying people in the world. They don't exist. Which is really liberating, isn't it? Uh, I know it sure looks like they exist. <laughs> Feels like they exist. But ultimately, there's other human beings just like you and me doing the best they can with what they have. And they're not the cause of my annoying. I feel annoyed because of my response to them and how I think they should be different, which is all really coming from me. And I planted the seeds earlier to be annoyed. So, uh, So this piece of wisdom is to understand that my ultimate liberation, genuine happiness, well-being comes from one place. Me. My suffering, and I'm talking about mental suffering specifically, mental suffering, emotional and mental suffering comes from one place. Me. You know, there's a lot of other conditions out there for car accidents and broken legs and things, but, but as far as my Anger, resentment, jealousy, frustration comes from one place. And more specifically, me is the root of it all, which is my own self cherishing attitude. Me more important than you. Me separate than you. Me much more concerned about my life than yours. And it's with this attitude that we create all this karma and distance and separation and barriers and labels. And then I'm better or smarter than you, or I'm less than you. Either way, suffering. And if we really grab that sense, it's this self cherishing attitude placing me as different, separate from you, more important ultimately to me than you, that creates all the suffering, the karma of grasping and attachment and aversion, that creates all the clashes that create the world we live in. And this text, both these texts, because we're actually saying this, right, um, is the path to really eliminate the root cause of all suffering, which is this self-cherishing attitude, the sense of self that doesn't exist and uh, is based in delusion. And the answer to it is cultivating bodhicitta, bodhicitta, the great compassion. And I wanted this book for a quote by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. As His Holiness describes bodhicitta as, here's the quote, kindness combined with the highest intelligence. Kindness combined with the highest intelligence. Virtue and wisdom. This is bodhicitta. Bodhicitta, the great compassion. The mind that is dedicated to liberation of suffering for all living beings. And this is the basis from which these Lojum teachings are all about. And with all that, it leads us to our verse 7. And in verse 7, we'll just read it, uh, we'll read it two other, two ways. Out of this text, transforming the mind. In brief, may I offer benefit and joy to all my mothers, both directly and indirectly. May I quietly take upon myself all hurts and pains of my mothers. And then I'll read it from uh, the other English translation. So this is a 
the eight verses that uh, came from my teacher, which we have as a handout, and um, if anyone wants it, just email us. We can down, uh, send it to you. So, in short, I will offer directly and indirectly every benefit and happiness to all beings, my mothers. I will practice in secret, taking upon myself all of their harmful actions and suffering. Really beautiful verse, very powerful, very specific teachings. Uh, this refers to Tonglen practice, the idea of taking and giving. And one of the most powerful, uh, really transformative practices to rid ourselves of this self-cherishing mind. And within Tonglen, it was interesting here, they said, I'll, in secret. It was actually a secret teaching for a long time. It wasn't uh, taught freely for a long time. But there's also more of a reference here, taking in secret, uh, meaning I'm not going to tell everybody what I'm doing. You know, <laughs> spiritual pride. Yeah, that's right. I meditated 24 you know, times. And I did this and I did that. And look how I'm helping people. You know, this is all about eliminating ego. <laughs> Not bragging about it, you know. And uh, so this um, this teaching, in short, I'm going to offer directly and indirectly every benefit and happiness to all beings, my mothers. Uh, they're really starting from a point within the trainings when we're talking about mothers as all beings. So in the uh, seven-point cause and effect uh, path to cultivating bodhicitta, the first step is seeing all beings as having been your mother, which is a really wonderful practice. So in uh, the idea that we've all been around many lifetimes, we've all been on this path of samsara over and over, cyclic existence, they call it cyclic for a reason. And we've all had immeasurable, innumerable lifetimes, we've been around for eons and eons, we've been in all realms uh, over and over, that at some point, everyone you meet has at some point been your mom. Okay, so I think about, well, there's the potential for that, right? Everyone's been your mom. Now, maybe we were ants together, you know, and you were my mom. Maybe we were humans, who knows? But the idea that at some point, everyone you met through eons and eons of this universe going around has been your mom, and it's, a, it's an interesting pro probability. Uh, one that they say is very likely. So if everyone you meet has been your mom, well, then they have this other, because uh, Tibetans are very logical, <laughs> They go, so if somebody helped you out and did you a favor today, and somebody helped you out and did you a favor 10 years ago, is the favor today more important than the favor 10 years ago? And we generally say, no, that doesn't matter. The favor 10 years ago is pretty important. So they would say, if somebody was your mother in this lifetime, or your mother in a different lifetime, does that really matter? And you start to open the door a bit open myself up to others and start thinking, well, okay, everyone's been here and been my mom. So when they're talking about mothers here, they're coming from the sense that we're all have been each other's mother. And that uh, it just opens a space of connectedness to find a, a link and a connection. The other version of this is also just the realization that everyone you meet contributes to the life that you have. Right? We would have nothing without others. So I know you've heard this many times. But whether I'm drinking hot water, whether I'm eating toast, the fact I'm speaking English, the fact we're here, able to participate, is because of all these unlimited beings you know, that built this building, <laughs> uh, where these teachings came from. I mean, just to have these teachings, imagine where this... This is a whole enlightened lineage that comes all the way down, traceable to my teacher to here. Think about the centuries of practice and the people to make this possible for us to be here, let alone where we got our meal, where we got the money to buy the meal, the grocery store, and on and on. And all the attorneys and lawyers to make this possible. And the uh, Logitech um, camera, and who made that? And where did they make it? And who created the science? And on and on. That everything that we have in life is because of others. And we're interdependent. And so if we start to understand that, we start to realize, wow, all these other beings are pretty important. 
they give me the life I have, and how I live in the world affects them. So all beings have been my mother. I, I like to play a little game with that because, you know, I tend to think that when we get really upset at people, frustrated, and they're an idiot or a jerk, and they're mistreating me or they're yelling at me. Now, if I think of them having been my mom, you know, it's kind of takes a little bit of the bite out, a little bit. You know, I had a good relationship with my mom. That doesn't work for everybody. Some people are not so strong. So, um, and uh, you know, just having that ease. So, I uh, got in this habit of uh, instead of Namaste. Namaste is, you know, I recognize and honor the divine in you. So they often say it's a beautiful translation. I think of Mamaste. Uh, I recognize and honor the mother in you. And uh, that little mama state just pops in my head. It just kind of lightens <laughs> up the thing while they're yelling at me. And, uh, but you don't want to giggle too much while they're yelling. It's not very beneficial. So, yeah, came up with this little mama state thing, which is kind of just a little play on words. It just helps me in tense situations. And uh, yeah, when we used to have a regular group back in, uh, yeah, they used to, mama stay, you know. So I recognize and honor the, the mother in you. So the idea then is that recognizing this in, in all beings, that I am going to practice giving and I'm going to practice taking the suffering. And uh, to set this up, it takes a little time to reflect on how important others are and how much I think of myself. You know, pretty much when we wake up in the day, and we're thinking about what do I want to do today? <laughs> and what am I going to feel good about? And what's, uh, you know, what am I going to try to avoid? We want to shift that mentality to here's another day that will never come again. I'm one day closer to my death. How can I make the best use of this precious human life? What's the most beneficial way to live today? Well, maybe cultivating some virtue and wisdom, living in this world in a meaningful way. And in that sense, coming to the world and understanding that if I, there's over 7 billion other humans, and when we're talking about all beings, we're talking about all beings, but just humans. Uh, and yet I think I'm more important than 7.5 billion, mm -hmm. which doesn't really hold up very well. And immediately puts me in conflict with if I'm more important, I'm now going to bump in with seven and a half billion other people who have other ideas about how the world should be. And uh, I'm in competition. And so this idea is that I'm going to take a moment to reflect upon others first and really think about their sufferings. And there's so much suffering. Well, we don't have to go far. I mean, and we've got the obvious Ebola that's that's going on in uh, in Africa. Um, we have Syria. We have these these um, states where people can't read or write. We have you know girls that have been kidnapped, you know, and forced to be um, married off to uh, war brides and so forth in Africa as well as in, in uh, the Middle East. But we can also look down the streets. We can look down the street at people we know. We can look at people in our lives. We can look at our cousins. We can look close at home, and we're going to find people that are suffering. We're going to find people who have very little happiness. We're going to find people that suffer, um, that are angry and resentful and bitter. We don't always have to look for the, the guy sitting out on the corner looking for a quarter. Sometimes the person in the $6 million home has no happiness at all. And so remembering that as humans, we're trying to find happiness, we're trying to avoid suffering. And so many people are suffering. And out of those seven point whatever billion, you have a rare and precious human at birth. Very few humans have it. Very few. And with that in mind, with this practice, how can we really make this life meaningful? And this is where the equalizing, exchanging self, this giving and taking, being connected to this practice of Tonglin becomes so beneficial. The idea of a Tonglin practice is that I am going to take the suffering of others into me. I'm going to give all of my virtue. 
And so I'm going to describe this really beautiful practice that Venerable uh, Geshe Sokum Gelsen, my, my teacher, taught me. It was the idea that visualizing that right here at my core, when, when we uh, tend to refer to mind in, in our Buddhist idea, we kind of point to our heart. Um, not that that's the exact location. Consciousness is this never-ending stream of consciousness. It's not just in the body, but it tends to be the last spot that your consciousness is before transition. It all sort of comes right here. And, uh, and so thinking that right here at this heart is this little black, dark, hard dot of my self-cherishing attitude. It's all of this karma and clay should bobbled up right here. And this is the source of suffering here. It's what's preventing me from really living openly and fully and beneficially. And then I have people, we're, we'll start with one person, you know, thinking of someone that we uh, know and care about, someone we know is suffering, and we visualize them in front of us. And we know that they're suffering, they're having a hard time, and I am going to become willing to take their suffering onto me, whatever it is, be it a terminal illness, be it a lot of just anger and mental anguish, uh, whatever that pain or suffering is, that I am going to be willing to take it on. So I'm going to draw from them in my breath this dark black smoke that is all their suffering. It comes into my nostrils, it comes down here, and as it hits my heart, it dissolves in this pure, radiant, healing white light because it destroys my self cherishing attitude. Destroy it because of the willingness to take it on. And now this virtue comes out and goes into them. And I see them getting healthier, better, and well. Taking it in, giving it back. Now, His Holiness makes a point in his book here that we need to approach this with a, a clear, proper context. And that is not that we're bad people. First thing, <laughs> Westerners, we always got to go, we're not bad people, okay, because, you know, we're really good at beating ourselves up. The self-cherishing attitude is not this, it's, it's just this mental plesia. And, uh, and this is actually a thing to dissolve. And that we're coming in this context to cultivate compassion. That we're coming here to really help ourselves in our spiritual path. Our spiritual path is going to be so much more beneficial when... I rid myself of this when I connect to others, when I cultivate compassion, then I can engage in the world more meaningfully and really flow on this path with bodhicitta. So the idea of doing this practice is that I am changing my attitude. Now, I may or may not, you know, the, the idea of where I heal someone else, that's not the point. The point is I'm healing me. I'm healing this really self-grasping, self-cherishing person and opening the idea that I'm going to take this on. And by doing so, I free up my mind. I change my attitude. Um, there's a lot of people that get fearful that if they think about drawing in cancer, they're going to get cancer. And uh, all the texts, His Holiness, my teacher said, that's not going to happen. This is for your mind. Um, there's the idea that you're going to take on pain. And there's uh, this... Uh, a monk who was in prison 33 years and tortured. I know I brought him up before. Um, he actually said that through his torture and 33 years and all the pain that he survived, it was the Tong Lin practice that kept him going and that it saved him. So he was actually, as they're torturing him, taking on all their karma and negative suffering and giving all of his virtue to them as they tortured him. And so you can see the incredible you know, value of a practice like this. Um, he got out, he smuggled uh, a bunch of torture in implements out. And, uh, but this practice then, with a full context, is that I, I want to make uh, this life meaningful. I want to participate in the world, and I want to open up um, this heart of mine. I want to give. So it's the practice of metta, of loving kindness. I'm giving loving kindness and compassion. I'm taking your suffering. Combined in one with wisdom. A really thorough practice. Uh, they often call the Geshe Gilts and the, the Tonglen Lama. 
He said if he was breathing, he was doing time right. You know, and he was saying, you can do it anywhere. <laughs> you can do it. Anywhere. You can be walking. You can do it. You know, you can be in line at the bank. You can do it. You know, it doesn't have to be a big uh, formal thing where I sit down. But as soon as we see something, we can do this. And it's as easy as breathing. It's as easy as breathing. So this practice then um, is a beautiful little meditation. And so uh, what I thought I'd do is kind of guide you through it. And we'll do a little 10 minutes. Now, in the, the teaching, they'll talk to you first. And that's kind of we've been talking about it. Is to sit down and just take a moment to remember everybody else. <laughs> to remember their suffering. To really cultivate some compassion before you do the practice. That you take a moment and you look at your life and you look at others, and it's not that you're any better off. Because that's not equity, that's you know, that's not compassion. Compassion is uh, that we're equal. That we all got our stuff, and other people have suffering. I have suffering. But that I do have something to give. I have something to offer. And I'm willing to do that. So we we sit back and we reflect at all the suffering, and then how can I help? And there's some things I can't do, right? I can't help Syria right now. You know, I can do some things. I can donate to, like, uh, Doctors Without Borders, right? I can do that. Uh, but a lot of times you feel pretty helpless. And, uh, and this is a really empowering practice. And the, the other piece to know is that it does make a difference. We tend to want a difference right now today. And we want to remember about the long run. I mean, if we've got lifetimes to go, as we become uh, better suited to cultivate our higher potentials, we help others. The better off we are, the more we can be of benefit. If we become enlightened, we can help others. Uh, much more so than I can do now. And so as we do this, everyone's going to benefit. As everyone else gets better, we all benefit. It has an imprint. It has an incredible imprint. And the ripples go. So in this practice, to take a little time just to cultivate some thoughts about others and suffering. And then, classically, they always teach, start with someone you like. <laughs> uh, this is an incredibly powerful practice for someone you don't like. Okay, so I used to do this practice constantly with political parties. <laughs> a lot of energy there. So come on, <laughs> fellas. We're all sitting in this room. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to cultivate compassion and uh, so but but they say you know we want to work up to it we want to work up to it it's easier to do it with people we like and then you know then we can venture out to people we don't know so well so for example you know Siri is a good, good point or someone that you've, you've noticed who's suffering um, and then ultimately spreading out to including the people we really don't like and, and see how we can do it there. But we don't start there. Everything is slowly, slowly. Steps. We start where we are. We start where we are. And so I'm going to invite you to just take a moment and think about, call to mind someone uh, that you know is going through a tough time, suffering a little bit. And then we'll see about doing a little bit of Tonglen practice with that. Three go. So just first take a moment to rest in your body and just relax for a moment, becoming aware of your breath, letting each in breath be an invitation to relax, each out breath, an opportunity to release.
Now take a moment to call to mind someone, someone you know and care about who is having a difficult time or suffering in some way. And take a moment to bring them present right in front of you. Really try to bring them as present as possible. Now take a moment to cultivate some compassion, a real strong desire to see their suffering go away, to know how much more they can benefit the world without this suffering. And when you're ready, then visualize that coming from them, all of their suffering comes out of their body in a dark black smoke. And it is breathed in through your nostrils and comes down right to your heart center, where it destroys all of your self-cherishing attitude and grasping this sense of liberation and virtue as you breathe out this radiant healing light goes into them and with each breath you see their suffering leave their body with each out breath you see them getting healthier and well you see them visually see some relief a relaxation in the face a smile some joy. So take a moment now to visualize breathing in all of their suffering and giving them all of your virtue, seeing them get healthy and well with each breath. Now take a moment to call to mind someone else or a group of people. Bring them present. Take a moment to see their suffering. Cultivate the compassion to remove that suffering. With a pure and open heart, as best as you can, Participate in the Tonglen, drawing from them 
their suffering, giving them all your healing virtue and kindness, love. A few more breaths now. Just really take some time to see them getting well. All stress faded away. Health and healing taking place. So that's a little taste of Tomlin. And um, you can see how powerful it can be, especially when we have some agitated feelings towards someone. And uh, when I, uh, I've um, first stopped uh, drinking and using, and my path was a path of recovery, and going to AA and, and NA. And, one of the most used tools that they give you in there is when you have resentments, they tell you to pray for the other person, <laughs> which is the same sort of piece that they said. If there's someone you really resent, you have you know some anger towards, go home and pray for them and pray sincerely from the bottom of your heart that they get whatever they need and that they're well. And, uh, and that was not an easy thing to do. <laughs> But I'll tell you what, it became one of the most powerful tools I've had. And so it was a really good foundation for coming here and doing this. Um, I did have to learn from my teachers to go slowly. Because when I first thought, I'd sit people down and go, okay, pick someone you really don't like. And they'd say, uh, let's start with someone they do like. Okay, Because, <laughs> you know, I, I had the practice of doing it for a while. Uh, but... The, the fuller context of this particular practice, there's only just one to make a couple points. One was that we're really doing this for that primary purpose of making this life meaningful, of removing these obstacles of this self-cherishing attitude that makes me separate and more important than me. When I can be a part, imagine what would happen if all of us thought, how can we make this a better place? Or what would be the healthiest thing to do here now, rather than what do I want? Imagine how life would be different if we all collectively thought, well, what would be the best thing to do here for all of us, instead of what do I want? And as much as we talk about it, and as much as we know it intellectually, we grasp to, when we wake up in the morning, what do I want? 
the other morning I came down, I, I had boiled some eggs the day before. About ready for my two boiled eggs. It's my little thing. I, uh, I make an incredible egg sandwich. It's really good. <laughs> She's looking at me like I'm crazy. Because I take a hard-boiled egg, I put in a piece of bread, and I throw some salt on it, and I roll it over, and I eat it. <laughs> it's dynamite. But remember, where's the delicious? All right? Not there. So, so I, you know, I had a couple extra. I came down in the morning, and they weren't there. Oh, it was devastating. For like all of a second. <laughs> But it's that moment I thought, that's really what I want. I want my two hard-boiled eggs. I'm guessing Dawson put them in school. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but even though it's a very simple thing, uh, there's this moment. There's this moment that comes up. Is why do I have my eggs? You know, my eggs. Not that they were our eggs or that they're from the family. And, you know, quickly today I go gravy gone for his lunch, and you know I ate something else. And uh, and we move on, but but there's that that me that pops up, even on very subtle things like that. Me, I want, I, and uh, um, and how often does that play in our mind? And how much does it just infiltrate all of our waking and any of the sleeping moments? So any time that we can offset that, any time that we like here today, we're taking an hour and a half where we're thinking about others, where we're cultivating compassion, where we're shifting out of that entrenched view of me and mine to we and ours. And that's really the purpose of this. And we need to do it uh, vigorously because it's so quickly me and mine in a heartbeat. And so the more that we do that, and that's why you know all these teachings talk about waking up and remembering this day, I'll never come again. And as much as I can, what are all these tools that are going to shift me into living in the real world, practicing Dharma with others and cultivating the highest potentials of a life in a day that will never come again? Well, what could be a better tool than breathing? It's one of the best kept secrets on earth. You're actually breathing 24 hours a day. Very few people realize it, <laughs> but you are. And imagine being aware of it. And imagine using that throughout your day when you're in line. Giving love to all others in line. It's a bang. You know, the person at the checkout counter with that long line, it's, instead of, man, why am I here in this long line? Why don't they hire more people? What about that poor person up there trying to get all those people out of line? Um, yeah, what about that? That we could actually be sending them love. And we can do it as easy as breathing. That's what my teacher always said. It's easy. You can do it any time. You're breathing all the time. And it's as simple as the breath. So um, he really encouraged us to do this regularly and you know, a little more formally, but then that way we can bring it into our daily life. Uh, one of my early practices in mindfulness before Buddhism was just being aware of the breath. And what that does is it brings you into this moment. Uh, without a lot of, you know, attachment, rumination, just being in this moment it helped me a lot before I was learning anything about Buddhism, really. And then, uh, just that alone reduced a lot of stress, but now to take that and cultivate it to practicing Dharma, that in every breath I take, I can be cultivating virtue and wisdom. Wow, that's as easy as breathing. It's a cool trick. So this precious practice has been proven throughout, you know, all these years to have been one of the most profound teachings on how to cultivate bodhicitta. I think one of the most important reasons is its practical uh, capability that this can be done as I walk, can be done when I sit. And then, as I've often uh, talked about, we will frequently say, I don't have time to do my practice. Do you got time to breathe? <laughs> I don't have time to meditate. You got time to breathe? What's preventing you? You know, 
not to be caught up in the ritual of how I need to do this or that, that every breath I take literally is my practice. How I treat you is my practice. But most importantly, if I can bring to mind the renunciation, uh, we would also call that a sense of um, what we call the empty nature of reality. If I can remember uh, how this thing really works and how I participate in the world uh, without all that label and projection and that what really matters is how I respond to you. Then every single thing we do is Dharma. And I don't care whether, you know, when I've uh, told you that story about uh, Geshe who was uh, pivotal in, in me actually cultivating a Buddhist path was gave this talk on Bodhicitta and he was saying the same thing how just going to the bathroom can be a Dharma practice. You know, he was thinking, may all the little bacteria be well and healthy. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, you know, I want some of that. Right, you know, like going to the bathroom. I mean, it, it has been a spiritual experience at times, but not in this way. <laughs> and um, and that uh, to have that, and, and the thing that made it real for me is he meant it. He meant it. I mean, this guy was love, you know, and it's palpable. He would hold your hand, and there's like, you know, Geshe Sonia, you know. Later, he became my teacher. I, was, I, I had no idea that would ever happen. But he'd touch your hand, and you, it's love, you know, and you could do It's just every breath he takes. And I thought, I want some of that. And it's really fun, too, when I was a monk and we were traveling with monks. Um, you know, monks in robes, and we're out in like Ohio and farm country, big burly guy. Monks will hold hands. So I'm gonna grab this guy's hands. Come on, let's take a walk. <laughs> and these big guys will let them take their hand and they'll go walk. It's the sweetest thing. I always thought, man, I wonder how this is gonna play out. And uh, and I'd see these big burly guys getting held and chatting on my little monks holding their hands. Because it feels good. <laughs> it's really, it's like, yeah, I want some of that. You know, you want the Dalai Lama touch. You want people in Bodhicitta touch. It's palpable. It's palpable because it's in every breath we're taking. It's generated. And uh, and that's, you know, I mean, we can see that in science today. It's, it's actually proven. But uh, so this practice then within this context is one that uh, is as easy as breathing, but as profound as the path to enlightenment. Tong Lin practice. And so you can look it up as well, Tong Lin practice. Uh, and uh, the more that we can cultivate uh, some awareness, though, of the suffering, you know, that, that really makes it potent. So that is the essence of this verse. Uh, I'm going to read it just one more time. In short, I will offer directly and indirectly every benefit and happiness to all beings, to my mothers. I will practice in secret, taking upon myself all of their harmful actions and sufferings. So nobody has to know when you're lying at the bank that you're wishing them loving kindness and that they may be well and that they may flourish, you know, and that person that's suffering. Nobody needs to know that but you. Um, so, um, yes? Is that why hugs work? Transfer of energy? Yeah, hugs, uh, uh, you know, our physical, you know, uh, there's actually, what's it, how long you got it, 20 seconds or something? Yeah, I mean, I think any hug is helpful, but uh, but there's this whole study on if you do it for, does anyone, is it 20 seconds or something? 20? Yeah. yeah, okay. I just thought that was the excuse the lady was hanging on to me, but. Uh, <laughs> or more. <laughs> uh, but they said, yeah, there's all those, those, those benefits, but there's a, but this palpableness, you'll notice, can happen without the touch. And you'll notice it around people. You'll notice it in a distance. You'll notice it in the field. Um, yeah, the touch can be really amazing. I've seen, uh, like I've, I've shared before, uh, you know, I've been, you know, in line where His Holiness is coming down to greet you and he touches your hand. And, you know, people forget whatever he said. And I've had people just, just explode like tears just that he touches them they're just boom, and so forth and we've seen it with other people as well but you feel it in people's presence when there's love you feel it you can be a foot or two away it's 
really quite precious. And uh, Father Cassidy, he's a Catholic priest. He's a meditator. Still is a meditator. Mm -hmm. A lot of years. But, you know, when that guy came in the room, I was like, yeah, I'm hanging out with him. <laughs> you know, he was just, he was cool to be around. He was cool to be around. Everybody wanted to rub up on that. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, so Where's people. Huh? Where's Father Cassidy? He was in Monrovia, my, my mom's parish. And uh, so he taught meditation. He retired now to teach meditation primarily. And, uh, yeah, it was kind of nice because when I be wanted to become a monk, uh, yeah, I told my mom who's a good Catholic goes to church every every day. When she got done laughing at me, um, <laughs> there you are, just with your ideas. Um, <laughs> she offered for me to, to then go see the Benedictine monks and spend some time with them. Uh, but uh, I thought, no, it's the Buddhist thing. She had me come sit with Father Cassidy and their meditation, and he was the one who told me it's real good. He's going to be a monk. It's really good. And made an all, made it all go away for us. So. Mm -hmm. Really nice. But this guy, I'll tell you, I was like, he's the real deal. Yeah. So all shapes and sizes. All shapes and sizes. Um, okay. So we're about to do a, a dedication. I do want to just acknowledge all of you over the internet. Um, it's uh, it's a joy to have you all here and, and a new thing for me. Um, again, these uh, teachings are offered. They'll be every week, and uh, through live stream, you can. Uh, attend. They're offered freely. If you do want to make a donation to the Way of Compassion Foundation, you can just go to the website. Again, uh, it's just Donna, and it's only freely offered. So again, teachings are always free. If you do want to make a donation, you can go to wayofcompassion.org and do that, and that allows us to, to keep doing this kind of stuff. Um, and all of you here, a joy to do this. A nice turnout tonight. And uh, we'll do our dedication here. In just a moment, I do want to acknowledge uh, Davi McKent, who's the co-host of this event, and Rita's here, and there are a wide variety of activities. She always has a lot to offer our community here. And so on that back table, if you can uh, interested there, there's a lot to look at to see what you're interested in. And uh, we'll be back here Wednesday, and these teachings will be archived then on live stream. So... Um, so they should be there for 30 days so you can uh, watch it if you'd care to. Um, so anyway, I hope it all works for all of you out there and it sounds good and all that stuff. And we'll do a little dedication. At the start, we did our motivation and now we'll do our dedication. For all the virtue and the wisdom we will turn away here today. Let us dedicate the virtue and wisdom that we've accumulated both here today and throughout our lives, both individually and collectively. We dedicate this for the benefit of all beings. May all beings be free of suffering and find lasting happiness. And may we be able to use the virtue and wisdom accumulated here today and throughout our lives to purify our own minds, to cultivate merit and wisdom on the path to enlightenment, our highest potential and achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all beings. All right. All right. Well, thank you all so much. It's a joy and an honor. And as always, stay out of trouble. Okay? All right.